Hello and welcome to the second Rally UK webinar on the Zero Emissions Strategy. And we, a few weeks ago, we were actually able to do a, a webinar about um, sustainable transport, active travel and micro mobility. But this week, we're going to focus very much on e-cargo bikes and zero emission logistics and look at how that can, can um, contribute to a zero emissions transport network. So thank you very much indeed to uh, everyone who's joined us. It's great to see so many people on, online. Um, thank you to our sponsor, Rally UK, for hosting our expert today. My name is Bayata Kubit, and I'm an independent researcher, writer, consultant in new mobility and innovative transport. And for the last nine months, I've been running a cargo bike delivery project in rural West Yorkshire, which has been quite an interesting experience. Um, so uh, without any further ado, let's have a, a, a um, bring the discussion round to our participants today. I've got Kit Winter, the Active Travel Policy Officer for the West Yorkshire Combined Authority, Aaron Nugent, Head of Programme Delivery uh, for eCargo Bikes for the Department for Transport, and Rosie Knight, um, the Programme Manager for the Energy Saving Trust, who's the eCargo Bike Lead. So welcome you. We've also got Ed Pegram from Rally UK, who's, I think, struggling slightly with his connection at the moment, but we're hoping that he'll join us very shortly. So the format today is very informal. Um, we'll be going around in order of, uh, of, of, with our participants, letting us know a little bit about what they're doing, um, with respect to e-cargo bikes um, and then we will throw the floor open to questions and it will be very much a chance for our attendees to ask questions, find out more about specific programmes and discuss with our experts um, how cargo bikes can help a sustainable transport future. So um, Kit, would you like to talk us through what's happening in the West Yorkshire Combined Authority with cargo bikes? Yeah, sure. Um, there's certainly quite a lot going on. Uh, I've actually just come from a site visit looking at hopefully doing some more with it, hence why I'm a bit damp and my glasses are all steamed up. So if you do raise questions uh, in the text, I won't be able to read them, but I'm sure Beato will put them to me if they're relevant. Um, we've actually, we're actually quite lucky in West Yorkshire. We've got uh, a, a sort of a whole range of things happening around e-cargo bikes. Uh, Bradford have got some uh, e-cargo bikes coming from the DFT fund, uh, which is really good. And they're working in city centres. We've had long had uh, last mile leads uh, operating in the city centre of Leeds. But we've also got uh, new uh, start, you know, startups or, or, or cargo bikes operating in places like uh, Todmorden with Beata over there or with um, Ilkley in a market town. And so we're really seeing the whole range of, of opportunities around the use of cargo bikes to try and reduce the impact of freight and delivering and servicing activity on a whole range of our urban and rural areas. And the benefits we're seeing from it, we're really keen to try and write down and note down so that we can spread that good learning uh, across, you know, not only our own authorities, but across the entirety of the North and the UK. Thank you, Kurt. Um, Aaron, how, how, how's the DFT supporting these exciting endeavours with cargo bikes um, across the country? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Aaron Nugent, Department for Transport, um, and I was leading on the cargo bikes uh, programme. So uh, back in 2018, uh, September, um, Jesse Norman announced that we'd be investing two million in e-cargo bikes, um, and it was going to come from the zero emissions uh fund for, from Olev uh, and linked into that. So luckily enough, we got that 2 million um, and we launched our e-cargo bike programme in April 2019. Uh, the specification was delivered uh, and developed with UK Cycle Logistics Federation and Bicycle Association and delivered for us by Energy, Energy Saving Trust. Uh, and Rosie's here to talk about uh, how the programme kind of went and what we delivered uh, later on. But um, from my perspective, I think it went probably um, not as not not as sort of great at the start because we we're expecting perhaps some large organisations to come in with big orders, so we, we, we're kind of prepared for that, uh, and that didn't happen. Um, we, we got a lot of uh, small medium enterprises coming in, which is fantastic, but um, you know to, to spend two million pounds is quite a task. So that's why we acted quickly to to use the. Um, local knowledge and expertise of our local authorities uh, to see what they could do uh, and and come up with in terms of schemes uh, to generate that local interest and, and use that local knowledge and expertise. So we um, developed the, the programme into a local authority offer and that went really well. Uh, and, and in fact, I think we had 
more bids and sort of a greater level of funding applied for than we actually had in the end. So it's a really good move uh, by by us and, and Energy Saving Trust to do that. Um, going forward, we, we're hoping to continue to invest in uh, eCargo bikes, and it was one of their commitments in Gear Change, which was the uh, government cycle and walking plan that was published in the summer uh, during COVID. So the details of that are still yet to be developed, but it is a commitment in there. And I think the success we're having with the uh, current eCargo bike fund with Energy Saving Trust is, is going to help a long way to, to stimulating that and, and continuing the programme. Thanks, Aaron. Rosie, would you like to fill us in with the Energy Saving Trust role in, in um, promoting and spreading the love for e-cargo bikes, which has been happening for the last over a year now? It's, it's um, been great seeing the scheme bikes hit the ground rolling. Yeah, it's been a really interesting project to be part of. So Aaron's kind of given a nice introduction to the scheme. And his, as he mentioned, um, the Energy Saving Trust for kind of administering it and um, supporting the applicants and processing the applications. So that formed um, the national scheme, which we began with, and then later on developed into a, a local authority scheme, which ran alongside um, the national scheme when we, we realised that we needed to really capitalise on the use of local authorities and their knowledge of their local areas, and also being kind of um, having being role models in the local areas as well so we that's what we um we decided to develop and it ended up as a as a huge success we had uh 58 different local authorities apply to us for funding which was a great result um after what aaron explained as a kind of slow start to the year um and we managed to fully allocate the funding that was available which is um a really nice kind of way to finish um this year what we've been doing is supporting those local authorities uh, with their applications. It's been a bit of a slog. Um, COVID has obviously Im impacted um, lots of the procurement and kind of supply chain. So lots of their local authorities are really only just receiving their bikes now and into the new year. Um, so we've been supporting them with the kind of setup and design of their projects, um, troubleshooting with them. And then alongside that, we've also done a lot of engagement work. So this is kind of uh, breaking down the barriers to access um, around things like knowledge um, about the e-cargo bike sector. So this has involved a couple of webinars so far um, in the end of November and the beginning of December, which were on maximising the use of e-cargo bikes in our areas and also uh, maintenance, which is a which is a problem that I think quite a few local authorities have come, um, come up against. So really trying to kind of share our learnings. And we also had panellists from kind of key players in the e-cargo bike area like uh, MP Smarter Travel and we also had Fully Charged, the e-bike store. We've also had um, applicants speaking. So we've had uh, Colchester, Brighton, Cambridgeshire all sharing their experience as well of kind of either setting up their projects or what they've what they've faced when looking at uh, maintenance, um, security and storage and things like that. And we're going to we've got some more engagement planned for the rest of this year. Thank you, Rosie. I think we've, we've temporarily lost Ed, so maybe we'll come back to him if he's able to rejoin us. Um, so the, que the first sort of question um, that I've had actually on the, um, on, the, on the list and also something that I, I'm quite interested in is uh, how many of the local authorities actually received the money and how can we find details of the pilots, how they're set up and how they're functioning? And I think it, what I particularly would like to know is how um, what the diff different roles the cargo bikes are having because I've I've seen different cargo bike projects. Some of them are very involved in sort of you know logistics, kind of DHL style logistics. We've got a subcontracted um, scheme in Manchester where the um, DHL subcontracts to a cargo bike logistics operator. We've got different micro logistics happening in Bristol and places like that. But what are the other sorts of models that are out there? Um, local delivery, you know, using them in different ways. Have you, have you got, have you got a kind of like nice overview of the sorts of things that we've, we, we, we're going to see in the next few years? Yeah, absolutely. So I think your first question was who got the money and, and kind of where can you access that information? So there were 18 successful local authorities um, and we did do a press release at the time, but it's available on our website. Um, I think perhaps the best idea is to kind of circulate a link after the webinar. Um, but all 18 local local authorities um, are kind of listed with the amount of bikes each. Um, claims were due end of November. So uh, in theory, most of the local authorities have their funding um, now. 
a last few kind of um, claims are still being processed that have had to go back and forth a little bit. In terms of use cases, there's a huge range, which was something that we were really pleased with when we were looking through the local authority applications. So there are the more traditional um, use cases, kind of courier and logistics, first mile, last mile things. But there's also some really nice use cases um, within local authorities. So that was a specific uh, stipulation of the local authority scheme is that the local authorities could use bikes within their uh, fleet or they could kind of partner with local businesses. So within local authority fleets, we see use cases of things like street cleaning, um, park maintenance, uh, trade waste collection um, and things like that and then for with businesses a lot of it is food delivery and courier services but also kind of mail distribution lots of um, or, uh, local authorities have worked with local universities so that could be um, kind of transferring things between campuses uh, transferring books between libraries um, parking permits that kind of thing so there's there is a huge range and um We've also seen things like uh, pool bikes, leasing schemes, um, try before you buy. So hopefully lots of different businesses will be able to experience, you know, what it's like having any cargo bikes and be convinced of the benefits um, without having to kind of put up that big uh, capital. Well, not, not big capital cost, but capital uh, cost that could be large to a small business. Thanks, Rosie. Kit, do you have any um, examples? I know that we can kind of, at Cargo Dale, we get stopped in the street sometimes with people who would like to have a go on the cargo bikes because they're thinking of replacing their car. Um, so that, that's been quite an interesting, the amount of interest that they actually um, gain when we're out and about on them is, is, is pretty good. So, Kit? Yeah, I mean, we've got one, uh, you know, there's, uh, if you took that Ilkley example I, I mentioned earlier, that's quite interesting in that it's doing a whole, it, it's kicked off particularly as a result of COVID. It's been uh, supplying, doing local deliveries of food and, and takeaways, as it were, in the Ilkley area from all the independent restaurants and bars up there that have joined together to form a kind of collective to try and keep themselves going in these, you know, slightly uh, unprecedented times, as we always call them. Um, so yeah, it's been really interesting looking at that. Um, obviously, another quite common use, uh, as Rosie said, was the, is the sort of universities or hospitals. NHS trusts are quite keen to explore a lot of this stuff as well and try and reduce their carbon footprint, particularly when they might have nearby campuses that often um, end up sending things to and from each other by taxi, which is, you know, firstly, incredibly expensive and be, you know, not very sustainable. Uh, so whilst the taxi drivers might not like it, moving that towards cargo bikes is certainly something that we've looked at uh, here in West Yorkshire across a number of different locations. We've not yet found uh, one that we want to take forward, as it were, but it's certainly something that we always look into. And um, as we're looking at redeveloping certain his, um, health sites in West Yorkshire, it's something that we're bearing in mind. Um, obviously, it's slightly different from us to, say, Manchester, where health is devolved as well, and there's a certain level more being able to tie it up. Um, the key thing that we're really concerned with at the moment is making sure that whatever infrastructure we put in or limitations on motor traffic that we put in, uh, these don't apply to cargo bikes and that cargo bikes can use all of our infrastructure. So that therefore the benefits of having a cargo bike are much you know, are more enhanced over uh, having a van. Thanks. Yes, I, I, one of the projects that I was involved with as an evaluator we had a cargo bike run by a with their locksmiths at, the, at one of the universities in Manchester and Oxford Road being Oxford Road and it's it's shut to mm. motor traffic. It was a, he was much faster to answer calls than anyone else because he didn't have to make a three mile round trip just to cross Oxford Road. So yeah, so there's a definite use case where the cycle infrastructure is better than the motor vehicle infrastructure. Aaron, what kind of strategic um, roles are you expecting for cargo bikes um, in, in the sort of like overall department's kind of plans for a future zero emission um, transport strategy? Yeah, I think, as I said um, in, my, in my intro, um, we have got a commitment in the gear change plan for uh, e-cargo bikes and supporting e-cargo bikes and, um, and freight to try and replace those um, kind of, you know, vans and, and and transit vans and things that go about towns and, and cities delivering those those goods um and originally the the cargo bike um program was was predominantly focused around those last mile deliveries um 
so I think that's kind of where it's uh, where it's heading. But um, it's just it, it's just interesting from a personal point of view when you, when you, when you're going about um, when you're involved in the program and then and then you go about your, your local area and you start noticing where businesses have, have got like a you know a, a moped or, or or something like that or um, you know using a van and you start noticing things. Well, that business could probably use an, an e-cargo bike and um, you know I'm I'm just conscious of how you get to that type of market and how you get to everyone um and i think going through the local authorities is the is the best place uh, for us to start with that rather than kind of you know having a scheme and then expecting people to you know stumble across it somehow um if if, if, if that's how it happens i know you can do your best to attract all of these companies but um it's really difficult so i think we're relying on that local knowledge to to get in there and stimulate that kind of growth thank thanks one of the, I've got a couple of questions that are quite practical here and quite interesting in, in terms of like the logistics of adopting cargo bikes. One is um, from Mark Strong down in Brighton. What point do the panel think it becomes more cost effective for a business to buy an e-cargo bike rather than use a logistics company? So it's the weighing up that, which we have also with motor vehicles. You know, at some point, some, some companies subcontract their deliveries out to other companies with vans or, and, some, and others have their own in-house van to make deliveries. And I think um, it's quite interesting how that could be modelled into cargo biking. Um, Rosie, do you have any kind of case studies of doing the cost benefit analysis for that? Um, it's actually something we're definitely working on. What we've found is that um, this year has been a little bit difficult to get uh, information on for case studies out of the small and medium enterprise businesses we saw applying to the uh, national scheme. And equally, the local authority scheme aren't, aren't quite uh, far enough along to kind of have that data. It's something we're looking at. In terms of um, kind of getting an e-cargo bike for your business, I think things that you need to consider as well as cost is kind of the storage and the maintenance side. Um, so if you have a if you have a place to store it, that's a really good place to start. Um, e-cargo bikes are famously a little, you know, sometimes can be a bit difficult uh, to store because um, they're kind of a lot, obviously a lot larger than a bike, but can't be stored outside um, like a kind of a small van can. Um, I think what we've we have got a last mile guide which do a breakdown of the kind of average running costs. Um, so this is looking at a push bike versus a van versus a e cargo bike. And what we found there was that the average running cost for a small diesel van for the year was about six thousand um, pounds. The average running cost for an e cargo bike is two hundred ninety five pounds. So it's a significant uh, decrease versus uh, a small diesel van. I'm not sure how much that helps your specific question of kind of um, using uh, someone else's cargo bike versus your own. But if you kind of look at a potentially around a £295 average running cost for the year, um, hopefully that might help your um, sums. I, I guess that's mainly the cake budget for the riders, isn't it? For £295. So yeah, <laughs> so I, 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 on a serious note, one of the things that we've found with Cargodale is that our monthly insurance is about £100 a month, whereas if we were running vans for delivery, that would be a, a lot greater besides the, the cake budget for the riders um, versus the fuel costs and, and things like that. Um, and the fact that anyone can ride a cargo bike, obviously you have to train people um, and make sure that they're, they're um, riding safely, but you don't have the same um, driving license requirements as you do for um, for van driving. Yeah, and I think this comes into uh, Tom's point that he's raised in the chat about whether or not, um, you know, current van drivers want to change over to cargo bikes or, or if, there's, you know, if there is actually an overlap in those people. And certainly I think so far the general experience has been that there isn't. Mm -hmm. Certainly all the cargo bike drivers that I've met have been people who'd much rather be on a bike than in a van. Um, I, I remember a conversation with FedEx where they were talking about uh, they've been driving e-cargo bikes and the people on the e-cargo bikes went mental for their first week where they were trapped in a van learning the run or learning, you know, the, 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 the process. Uh, and likewise, all the dram drivers who tried the e-cargo bikes really didn't like it um, because they're so used to, you know, a much more sedentary uh, existence. So I think there's a certain level at which if you're just trying something out, 
um, you do have to expect there to be some level of kickback from your your driver or whatever. But I think it's also probably something where your driver might be pushing for it as well if they might, if they want to cycle more. So I don't know quite what the answer is, but it's a, an interesting one to look to think about. I think so, we we found that definitely in in Cargo Dale that we found that people wanted to volunteer to ride cargo bikes, mm. whereas they wouldn't be volunteering to drive. So there's a, a completely different. Um, profile of person who wants to be involved in logistics if it's a cargo bike not a car or van rosie and then we'll bring ed in to introduce what rally's up to because he's reappeared amazingly something to kit's point is that to add is that there are becoming more and more models on the on the market that are four wheel and do have that kind of cover on them which kind of getting closer and closer to a van so hopefully with more models available um more traditional van drivers might be kind of happier moving into a into an e-cargo bike. Thank, thanks, Rosie. So, Ed, welcome, welcome to the Rally UK seminar on active travel and zero emission transport. Would you like to share with us what you've been up to for the past uh, uh, year or so on on cargo bikes and uh, and the contribution that you're making to this uh, strategy? Sure. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me. Okay. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah, firstly, apologies. Had some technical issues there. Clearly, uh, I think the rain here in Nottingham was affecting the internet connection. <laughs> um, so really interesting just listening to your final points there. I think, um, you know, I think we have to be mindful about the market, um, road users and the products that we introduce. I mean, the current products that we have certainly do focus on an adaptation of, of the bicycle. I think like you're mentioning, you know, there's there's lots of new models that are entering the market that sort of blur the lines between a commercial vehicle and a bicycle. And I think, you know, as the market grows, what we really need to do is work with local authorities and central government to, to make sure there's the right training, uh, both for users, uh, the right understanding from from local authorities um, and the right infrastructure for, for, for these uh, for these new vehicles that are on the road. Um, but I mean, for, for Rally uh, and for me, um, it's been about getting the product out there in front of uh, as many people as possible, actually, if I'm honest. It's it's um, it's a growing market massively. If we look at um, what's happening in Europe, uh, sales of cargo bikes are doubling, um, but they have a vast infrastructure uh, for cargo bikes and bicycles in, in general. And I think we're playing catch up to a certain extent um, having said that, there's some big changes with the, the gear change document and all the funding for, for active travel, which is great news. So, you know, for us, it's about getting people testing the products in the right way so that the market grows in a sustainable way uh, and, and a safe way. You know, cargo bikes are totally different. So, like I said, it's about getting people uh, testing them and, and getting people uh, trained um, to use them properly, uh, much like how, how you guys are using them in um, the Calder Valley. So um, it, it's about getting bikes out there to, to trial and, and see what they're about for us. It's certainly been exciting trialing car cargo bikes in the Calder Valley, that's, that's for sure. Um, I've got a few questions sort of around uh, legislation um, coming through. I think um, one in, in particular is about um, the more powerful cargo bikes and, and whether um, with the UK withdrawing from the European Commission's Motorcycle Working Group, has the DFT already taken a decision regarding the continued application of EC 168 stroke 2013, which is the type approval for L category vehicles uh, or e-bikes with more than uh, 250 watts? Um, and there's a quite a practical application for this. Um, one of the things that we had in, in, um, in Cargodale is uh, we, we find that we can use a single motor um, cargo bike um, for the hilly climbs around the area but we can't use the trailer a, a, a power assisted trailer with a cargo bike because that technically is beyond the specification that um, a cargo bike um, can uh, is legal for so, so having two motors one on a trailer and one on a um, bike not illegal um, is that potentially something that um, we we could change um, or decide on um, and also the other thing is you know what about more powerful e-cargo bikes is that a potential possibility um aaron would you like to comment 
Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's not something that I'm currently involved in or aware of. Um, but obviously, the, 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 with the kind of um, you know Brexit situation and things like that, then it gives you more flexibility to to develop different standards and, and regulations to suit us. And I think in terms of e-cargo e bikes for for, for us, um, you know, it, it's kind of relatively early days, so we've got to use that learning um, that we get from the from our programs and from delivering the schemes and. If there are barriers to using, um, you know, e-cargo e e bikes or for people using e-bikes, then that needs to be taken into account and then factored into any future developments. So not currently something I'm, I'm, I'm aware of or involved in, but um, it seems a, a sensible approach to sort of learn from what we're doing and then use that learning to develop any, uh, you know, future, future programs and products um, going forward. I think there is quite an interesting sort of gap where Rosie was talking about the um, e-cargo bikes that technically fulfil the um, criteria to be a pedal cycle because they are assisted, assisted by electrical um, power, um, but are much more shaped like a little tiny weenie van. Um, and, and then the quadricycle type type approval where you've got sort of things that are bigger that have more um, legal requirements around them. So I think, you know, there, there's definitely a sort of small vehicle um, a small vehicle uh, question mark. Uh, and I think the DFT actually consulted on that as part of the Future of Transport consultation. Uh, was it last year? I, I've completely lost track of time this year, but I think it was only that last year that, yeah, <laughs> that we yeah. all come and commented on that. Um, so uh, I've got some more questions here uh, for, for anyone to jump in with. Um, are you noticing an increase in interest after the growth of active travel infrastructure delivered through the uh, pandemic, um, including the cycle lanes and low traffic neighbourhoods? Um, do they create a bit better business case for cargo bikes? Anyone want to come in with that? Go on, Kit, go for it. it it's an interesting one because um, traditionally a lot of couriers or hauliers uh, and th third party logistics firms who do these deliveries are against LTN schemes um, initially. Anyway, they you know they, they aren't necessarily in favour of them straight up because they see it as making their lives more difficult and enhancing you know, increasing their journey times. Um, and there's kind of two two responses to that. One is to suggest that they take an e-cargo bike, which obviously fits through the gaps in the planters, and off they go. You know they, they've they've not lost any journey time. And that's certainly something I know um, some of them are looking at, particularly in areas where there's been a large scale deployment of them, like in London. But what's also interesting is that actually the LTN impact in terms of once it's bedded in beyond the first few months is obviously to actually reduce traffic and through traffic in the area. Uh, and by taking traffic off the roads, it often actually enables more deliveries to be done and reduces congestion. So actually it speeds up the van times as well. So LTNs have uh, benefits for both uh, e-cargo bikes and for van travel. Um, even though it might seem slightly counterintuitive. What is interesting, though, is that in terms of um, sensible routing for small packages, cargo bikes are definitely preferable um, in that they can nip through, you know, do through routes through areas, whereas um, vans are often much better used for slightly larger deliveries where they can drive up to a central point, stop, and then deliver to a number of households. Anyone else uh, would like to comment on that? Yeah, if I could jump in there, it's actually a really interesting point. So um, I think, it, it, you know, we're kind of mirroring what Kit is saying there. We're not saying that cargo bikes or rally cargo bikes are the, the complete solution. I think we're just trying to say that there is this huge opportunity, uh, you know, as, as an example, lots of delivery vans drive around in these sort of large commercial vehicles and they're only a quarter full. You know, they're, they're, they're only stacked, not even a metre high with with uh, with boxes. And I think, um, you know, the, the two things that cargo bikes can do is is sustainably and affordably link uh, into urban areas, whether it's logistics, urban logistics or even um, to enhance uh, the image uh, and accessibility of, of small businesses. You know, we've been having discussions with butchers and bakers and 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 all sorts of really small businesses that you yeah, have taken interest in in cargo uh, because it's an affordable way of um you know moving moving goods um so i think that's that's really key to it and i think you know in answer to your question there i think yes 
um, the pandemic and the, the, the wider effects of it have really meant that um, everyone is looking at any kind of alternative um, businesses, individuals as well. So I think, you know, one thing that has been touched on is, you know, family cargo bikes. There's this massive opportunity for family cargo bikes to uh, um, assist with, with, you know, transport, effectively transport families. And then the other question that's coming through, which sort of connects to the active travel, emergency active travel infrastructure is um, how, um, how, how is the active travel infrastructure in gear change being implemented? Um, what, what, what about the requirements of, uh, what about the impact of the requirements um, for infrastructure to accommodate larger cycle, cycles? And how in our local authorities going to have to pay for this or is there a central funding to pay for this? I think that's one for you really, Aaron. Yeah, um, that, that, that is a, a point that's in our uh, emergency active travel funding. So we, we, we gave um, funding out in the summer for a tranche one um, to, to a number of local authorities. And we've recently, within the last couple of weeks, uh, awarded tranche two, which I think is around about 160 million, something like that. So it's a lot of money. Um, and part of the requirements for the um, active travel funding for local authorities is that they um, design their schemes in accordance with the LTN. Uh, and the LTN uh, 120 obviously includes provision for, um, you know, cargo bikes and, you know, adapted cycles and, and things like that. So, um, again, the, the onus is on the local authorities to kind of develop their good cycling and walking plans um, to, that make kind of use of their infrastructure, um, taking into account, you know, their the transport hubs, um, how they can get those kind of cargo bikes and, uh, you know, general public using the, the, the cycle infrastructure and then um, trying, to, trying to put on the, uh, you know, deliver the schemes well, deliver them in accordance with the LTN, uh, but then promote them and get people using them so they're not empty. So we try and get away from the, the negative kind of publicity that's been uh, sort of quite prominent recently over the last few weeks uh, with, with the funding going out. So it's really important that everyone plays their part in, in using the infrastructure and promoting the, the good practice and the good things that, that are coming from it. We'd just like some in Calderdale, um, please. <laughs> we, we didn't get any real active travel infrastructure um, that our cargo bikes can use at least. And I think there's a real practical point that's being raised about the wider um, wider vehicles is that you can rock up on a cargo bike which has got 100 kilos of shopping on it and if there's a step or two in your way that can really mean you know either a massive diversion turning round or um, spit breaking all your eggs which is um, not something you want to be doing as a cargo bike rider so there is you know there's a lot of practical things that really need to be sorted out to make to increase adoption of cargo bikes um, also got a really interesting uh, question here for, about rail um, and how we can adopt um, rail in cargo logistics and it's from Deb Carson I think I've just lost it I'm afraid on the um, but it was asking about how we can incorporate uh, rail in uh, passenger rail so small package transfer between stations so that cargo bikes can do, take the onward delivery um, and this is something I'm really interested in because I've already talked to our local um, northern um, rail about being able to do this because we have lots of little we have three little hubs in Calderdale um, with quite long skinny roads in between that aren't that efficient for cargo bike delivery whereas the towns themselves have very dense drops so it would be really interesting to know if there's any plans in any of your various schemes to help support um, small package and rail. Um, I'll jump in. Not, uh, unfortunately, not that I'm aware of at the moment, but something to definitely think about in the future. I can, I can say something about that, uh, if you like. It, it, incidentally, um, Cycle Rail is one of my other programmes. Uh, that I'm responsible for, so it kind of links up nicely. Um, and predominantly, we've been concentrating on uh, cycle parking at stations and improving, um, uh, you know, access for for bikes to to use um, their, their their bike as part of their journey um, and going onto the train. And um, our delivery partner, Sustrans, I'm currently talking to them about the uh, opportunities that might exist, uh, particularly with Northern, to to maybe trial something. Um, movable seats that type of thing so we can if, if if the seats aren't booked out we can 
um, you know, make use of that space for uh, cargo. And then obviously when that gets to the other end, what happens to it, it's going to need space for people to, to unload it and then, uh, you know, pull up and, 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 and move on and then go on to the local network with, again, good infrastructure. So, again, it's trying to tie all of these things together um, it, it, it into one seamless kind of package is the trick. But um, it's early days, but it's certainly something we're looking at. We uh, in West Yorkshire, we're looking at how we can best uh, tie up. So as we'll get to you eventually, Beata, I promise. Um, we're looking at how we can best uh, tie our uh, multimodal options together. Like Aaron said, originally we're looking at this very much from a passenger perspective of being people getting to and from the railway station. But um, like you say, um, places like the Airedale or the Wharfdale lines, where it's a hundred mile an hour uh, electric um, rail passenger stock rattling up and down, which is, you know, especially at the moment is quite empty during the day. Um, there's a real opportunity that the roads on these are very congested and actually a cargo bike and a rail combination would be much faster. Uh, a good friend of, of us all, I'm sure David Holliday has, you know, done endless, endless studies that demonstrate the value of doing it in Edinburgh to Glasgow. Um, and so I think you can really, you know, it does really stack up. What's interesting is about making sure, though, that like Aaron says, that we, we, we there's step-free access to all the platforms so that the cargo bike can go straight through. And that's where we end up with issues potentially around things like uh, gating at stations that, you know, we're trying to bring in gates across a lot of the rural network to try and, you know, manage revenue better. How can we get cargo bikes through that? And of course, a lot of our stations and networks still aren't necessarily disabled friendly yet. So we need to make sure that as we roll out improvements from an equality perspective, that we can make you know, small changes here and there to those plans can suddenly make cargo bikes on the platform very viable indeed. Um, I know also that there is currently ambition with, within Northern to look at better integration between cycle and rail. Uh, I don't know if that extends to cargo, but I know they've been looking at uh, whether or not they could do something similar to what ScotRail have done with the old uh, 153s, is it? Single old DMUs where they've basically taken out seats and turned them into uh, bike carriages. And there's no reason at all that if you did that, you couldn't have flat spaces in there for cargo bikes to even go on the train uh, between stops. I, I think, yes, definitely. The step-free stuff is really, really important. I think it's very important generally from for an accessibility point of view. Um, and you know, I live um, that we're near a station, Todmorden Station, doesn't have step-free access to both platforms, so it would be pretty tricky to do that at the moment in both directions. Um, so, so yes, so I think there's still quite a lot of pieces to the jigsaw that aren't specific to cargo bikes. They're more about we need you know, a lot more level access. We need better, we need better cycle infrastructure in general um, and, and more kind of understanding that not everyone can, um, you know, can do things on really skinny pavements even, never mind skinny cycleways. Um, so there's a, there are some other questions about uh, school, um, school cargo biking. Do we know of any schemes um, out there, either through the EST or Rally's own or kit, um, where people are taking children to school in cargo bikes um, as it's maybe shared um, cargo bikes or anything like that in the UK, or is that a completely new thing um, in our country? I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, so we actually don't have a family offering at the minute. Um, as will be coming next year. But um, through early conversations that I've had with, with local authorities and, and some retailers we've had, you know, if you take Cambridge as an example, cargo bikes there, in particular family cargo bikes, um, I think mainly it's it's because the fact that they have really good infrastructure and, and wide cycle lanes. So wide, set, completely segregated cycle lanes, particularly on the um, sort of inter interurban links. So they have um, guided bus routes with large um, separated cycle lanes that travel all the way from park and rides, which are on the outskirts of the city, right into the centre. And I think that in itself encourages people um, to, to go by a cargo bike. But Cambridge will be introducing a uh, loan scheme where they purchase um, a number of cargo bikes, whether it's family or business bikes, uh, to loan um, to people for short periods of time to see if they're, they're a viable solution. Um, and, and that'll be a multitude of brands and cargo bikes, different shapes and sizes, which I think is is probably a brilliant initiative. I think there's there's lots of barriers. We find security 
an issue we find uh, uh, parking um, perhaps cycle confidence is, is another issue to, to cargo bikes um, and you know that you know besides all of that they're quite a, a financial commitment and, and I think we've seen it with electric cars you know the adoption of electric cars will come but because it's such a huge financial commitment people are a little bit you know they have reservations and so schemes like this the the sort of try before you buy that um cambridge city council are going to run um next year i think will be absolutely uh vital to to the success of, of business and family car bay bikes anyone else hope you're looking keen sorry rosie after you Thanks, Kit. I was actually just going to, I was also going to give the example of, of Cambridge here, so I'll keep it short for um, us. So we, um, lots of the local authorities haven't specified exactly if it's kind of a leasing scheme or a, a share, a, a pool scheme or res residential sharing scheme. We don't know exactly that's going to uh, benefit families from going to schools, but we imagine, and Cambridge is, is one of them, which is obviously setting up this try before you buy scheme and they have 30 bikes um, which they were awarded through the grant fund. So I imagine that's something that's hopefully going to benefit lots of families and give them that opportunity to try before they before they invest. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to build on on, on Ed's point about how it's it, and it comes back to our earlier point about cargo, how uh, cargo bikes and rail. It's a whole those little things need to be in place to make it work. Currently in West Yorkshire, we're only just really starting the school streets revolution where we can close the streets, you know, around pick up and drop off times to enable um, uh, those sort of cargo bike deliveries of kids to, to make sense in a safe environment. I think the, the other thing that's important to think about when it comes to the cost of a, an e-cargo bike is that we're not sort of trying to sell them as an alternative to a bicycle. It's very much an alternative to a family car, the second car, the run around. And I think that comes hand in hand with the rollout of LTNs, is that if that little runaround no longer is the most convenient way to make most of those trips, but you still have small children, you want to get from place A to place B, the, and there's you know, a no through traffic route you can do that on, something that the e-cargo bike is an alternative to that Honda Jazz or that Vauxhall Corsa or whatever it might be, really stacks up as an alternative. So we've got three minutes left. Um, so very quickly, I, I, I want to just confirm that um, one of the people that tried out our cargo bike is now using bought us bought one and is using it in the hills above Hebden Bridge, never mind in the valley, um, to ferry her three children around. So it is completely possible that, as my Ed says, that you know you need to have a lot of bikes out there to try and to give it a go and to compare the cost and everything like that. So very quickly, the last question from Ollie Ivans uh, is about publicity. Is there are there any plans to have a national cargo bike? publicity extolling the benefits especially as today we i've just found out on the internal chat that um the um there's a landmark inquest into the death of ella kissy debris confirming that air pollution was part of the reasons on her uh, for her, the cause of death and that's actually confirmed on her death certificate which is a very painful and apposite reminder that this is a really important thing that everyone is doing, bringing cargo bikes into into use and stopping the use of um, diesel and petrol vehicles and switching away from that as, as quickly and, and efficiently as we possibly can. So plans for plans for promoting the cargo bike. Aaron? Yeah, I think it's it's not just cargo bike, it's, it's all sorts of active travel um, and, you know, promoting the health benefits and the uh, you know air quality benefits that come with that um, and it's you know on a on a individual level as well but also for communities and and, and things like that so again you know a lot of our programs um, involve uh, you know working with local authorities working with energy saving trusts working with Sustrans different delivery partners and um, we all need to play a role in you know getting that message out there um, and you know, making that infrastructure that we put in that people is so visible to people, getting it used, and you know, looking for those good news stories to say you know people feel better, they're, they're having less less days off sick from work, um, you know, they're happier, their mental health and well-being is a lot better from being active. Um, so it, a cargo bike plays a part in that, um, and you know, it, it, it's it's on the whole kind of supply chain and the whole chain to do that. It's not just on uh, on the central government, it's for everyone to get those good news stories locally heard um, and, and 
promote the, the, the good work that everyone's doing. Brilliant. And any more funding on the horizon either? For, 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 uh, for us in terms of funding, uh, we're, we're, yeah, it's, it's in gear change. So it's definitely something we're, we're looking at in, in conjunction with e-bikes as well. So, um, you know, that's something in there. But the actual details on, on the funding is, uh, is still to be decided. Brilliant. I think that's a really wide ranging discussion on, on the whole of the, um, the sector and the area. Um, where are we? So, Ray, was there any other comments or notes um, that anyone wants to um, add? There was one down? thing, which was uh, on the sort of uh, publicity front, which is that we are planning in the new year to get in touch with our operators from Last Mile Needs and Cargadale, sorry, Beata, um, <laughs> and also Ilk, the ones in Ilkley and the ones in Bradford, and really uh, try and get that whole range from you know, rural market town to a big city, and really pushing how um, you know we, we, we can support them and how that the, they find the infrastructure useful and how they're finding it better than vans, and trying to really get the message out there for West Yorkshire that, that these things are not just sort of a, a niche interest, but actually a really viable option for, for all sorts of different settings. So that'll be coming in the new year. Anyone? Yeah, and I'd just also say that we are planning on doing kind of uh, local uh, case studies on the, the biggest local authorities. We've got more webinars coming up and more engagement material. So we'll continue to share all our learnings um, that we've we've been given through the uh, local authority grant and the national scheme grant as well. Start. Uh, just uh, just a final comment from us is that uh, for next year we're just going to continue to do the same thing you know working with local authorities and businesses to uh, get people on cargo bikes and testing them to see if they're viable for, for businesses and uh, well anyone really so we just keep continuing pushing the message that they're, they're a good thing. I think that's one thing that we've definitely learned in the last few months and since the beginning of the um, the government grants in, that, that starts were launched in 2018 is just how wide ranging the uses of cargo bikes can be um, right the way through from traditional logistics operations through to local delivery, through to locksmiths, through to, you know the replacement of the works van, um, school runs, the whole kind of like panoply of transport that people can take up with electric cargo bikes from personal right the way through to multinational corporation. And I think that's where there's, there's a massive, massive opportunity for switching away from um, needing to use petrol and diesel vehicles, um, which is which is fantastic to know that it's it's relatively cheap. They're not they're not cheap vehicles in themselves, but they are relative compared re relatively less pricey compared to um, you know ten thousand pound plus petrol or diesel car, and um, which ranges right the way up, you know, to you, you can tens of thousands of pounds. They're cheap to run, and um, they require quite a bit of cake, but, um, you know, the insurance is relatively a lot less, and, and, and the requirements are a lot less. And, and the fact is that the people that ride car bike, cargo bikes that I know are very happy people because it's a great it's a great thing to do. It gets you outdoors and you feel like you're doing something that's positive, environmentally friendly and, and shifting things around the world, giving you a bit of contact with people um, as you ha hand over packages, pick up packages, pick up kids, whatever you're doing. So I think one of the nice things about being involved in cargo bikes is that degree of personal contact and and outdoorsness and so you know it's 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 been a great experience and i'm very glad to have had so many experts to talk to me about this experience um thank you very much all of you for your contributions and i hope that the um people watching have found that useful and informative um do get in touch we can look at questions after the event and provide links as well so thank you very much everyone and, and goodbye for now Thank you. Thank you.